All right, before I forget, we are still giving away these two books for free. If you call us or email us, we will send you Things I Have Been Taught from the Bible That Are, are Not True by Mike Stewart, and also Jesus Wasn't Talking to You by Terrence McLean. If you send us your snail mail address, we will ship those out to you free of charge. If you want one or two or 30, doesn't matter to us. Uh, this is supported by gracious folks around the, the country and the world who give freely, and uh, that's how that is supported. So if you want any of those, please email us your snail mail address, and we will get those sent out. Um, the last couple weeks, um, Mike has been talking about some of the accusations that have been brought up against us. And when, when stuff like that's brought up, I, I kind of get geeked, I guess is the, the correct term, geeked, like excited, like something that I get into. Um, and he did a really good job the last two weeks, and very grateful for that. Those were really good. Um, one accusation that he brought up was we overemphasize the Apostle Paul over Jesus. Now, Mike went through these accusations and addressed them through the Bible with the Bible. And I hope you have come to the conclusion we do not, in fact, worship Paul, which he brought up and elaborated on, uh, but we magnify Paul's office, which we will start in Romans 11. Mike went through some of these, but I, like I said, I get excited when I, when I hear messages like this. And I, I just want to kind of maybe just stick there for one more week and kind of go through that um, just a little bit more. Romans 11, verse 13. Romans 11, 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation or jealousy them which are my flesh and might save some of them. We're going to get into why that's such a, such a cool verse, um, a cool couple of verses. Mike also <laughs> talked about um, Paul was not part of the disciples, as he, as he shared the last couple weeks. Um, let's go to Galatians. We'll kind of just run through these real quick. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul states, Paul, an apostle not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Galatians 1, just maybe flip a page over to verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the last one, actually, verse, uh, just jump down to verse 15 and 16. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul was a new apostle to the Gentiles. If you flip back to Romans 11, real quick. Romans 11:13. Again, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. What I was thinking about this, um, don't you think it's funny that God made a Pharisee of Pharisees an apostle to the Gentiles? Do you realize what that meant to a Pharisee? Let's look at Acts 22, verse 21. 
Acts 22, verse 20. Let me see. Acts 22, verse 21. In verse 21, Paul's recounting before the mob of what the Lord said to him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no. Just those words. Let's look at verse 22. Just those words. This is what the audience said. And they gave him audience unto his word, and they lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Just those words, they wanted to kill him. What were the Gentiles considered among the Jews? Dogs. Dogs. Filthy. Paul says himself he was a zealous Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is a member of an ancient Jewish sect that accepted the Mosaic law and oral traditions associated with it and emphasized strict observance of ritual. We read what happened in Acts 22, 22 after Paul said, or after Paul was recounting what was told him by the Lord in Acts 20, or verse 21, just speaking those words, they wanted to kill him. Let's look at Romans 1. Why were Gentiles considered so... Disgusting. Romans 1, verse 19. We're going to go through a couple bef verses before we see why they were so disgusting. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an, into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. This is why they, the Jews hated and were disgusted by the Gentiles. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through their lust through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now you understand why those folks 
when Paul spoke those words. They wanted to kill him. You're going to who? You're going to the dogs? What a waste. You might as well be dead. What I like about Paul is he was not ashamed of the gospel he received from Jesus Christ. While he was on his way on the road to Damascus, speaking about slaughtering the Jews, I'm going to kill those stinking bleepity bleep Nazarenes. Boom. Saul. Saul. Why persecutest thou me? Let's turn to Romans 1 again. Oh, actually just look at 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Why was Paul not ashamed? Turn one page over. Romans 2.16. I don't know why I didn't see this before. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That's why he's not ashamed. I was talking with a, a good friend and um, was trying to share the, the gospel message given to Paul and the difference between the law. And I said, which, which gospel can save you? And the answer that I was given was both. And I said, how can you have the law and grace at the same time? And there was kind of confusion there. But this verse sums it up very clearly. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus, by Jesus Christ, not by Paul, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, Paul's gospel, which was given to him. This week we were celebrating my, my daughter's birthday, <clears throat> and we went, to, we went to a restaurant, it was a Mexican restaurant, and we were sitting there for about five, ten minutes, and there was a gentleman that came in, a taller man, pretty stout, pretty big guy, and he sat down and um, I saw the, the waitress go over to him. And then I saw that one of the owners come out to the table and they're talking, kind of laughing, and, and it just seemed kind of odd because he was, you know, they were talking back and forth. And we hadn't got our food yet, but um, right after we got our food, I saw this, the owner coming out with a giant, it was like a platter. It was giant. And she's carrying this thing, and it, I didn't catch my eye really till it's, they were right next to me. And she sets this platter of food down on the, the table in front of this man. And it was a seven pound burrito. Oh my God. Enormous. <laughs> Full of jalapenos and hot peppers, chilies. I mean, just steaming. And it, it was incredible. And so here, here is this challenge they have to whoever takes this on. You have 30 minutes to finish a seven pound burrito. And so they're talking back and forth, and he's asking for water. I'd like a pitcher of water. I'd like two glasses. Um, and another, he asked for another plate. So the owner's like, are you ready? You're going to start. He said, no, I, I need to cut it open. I'm going to take it. It's steaming hot. I, need, I want it to cool down. I'll let you know when I'm ready. So it was a couple minutes. 
And so they start the timer and they start recording this guy. And he is just shoveling it in. And just shaking his head. I'm, <laughs> it's disgusting and intriguing at the same time. This is like a train wreck. You could not stop watching this guy just, I mean, five minutes straight. It's like, are you going to breathe? You know, take, a, take some water, eat some more, take some more. I couldn't stop watching it. And I'm trying to eat, and by that, when he started eating it, we were about done. Like, I, I felt I was halfway done, and I just, I'm done. Like I said, it was disgusting and interesting at the same time. We'll get there. <laughs> I don't even know how much it cost, but it, it, was, it was interesting. So think about that. But I'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. I think that's why, in regards to such a silly story, that's why Peter had such a hard time understanding Paul's gospel. Because it was so much that he had, he'd never even heard of this before. He'd never even seen something like this before. When Paul went to Jerusalem and, and sat down with Pete and the boys for 15 days, even, even Peter said in, in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, let's look at that real quick and how, what his thoughts were on this giant burrito that was set down in front of him. 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter 3, verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood. I could not understand how this guy was continuing to eat this burrito. Paul had a hard time with the things that were revealed to Paul. Or Peter had a hard time understanding those things that were revealed to Paul. In three years that they were with Jesus, he never said anything to us about this. Paul's going to the Gentile dogs, those filthy, nasty, worldly, pagan people. This was hard to understand. Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees who understood the law, they added to him nothing when he went and talked to him. He knew the law. He knew all those things they were teaching. They didn't add anything to him. He already understood. He never forgot that, what he learned under, under Gamaliel. He never forgot the fact that he was holding the coats of those people who were stoning Stephen screaming out condemnation and slaughter of this guy. He didn't forget those things. He knew the Mosaic Law. It's interesting how God works sometimes. In Galatians 2, verse 6, it says, But of these who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person, for they who seemed to be something in conference added nothing to me. He didn't receive his gospel of men. Let's go to Ephesians real quick. This is probably my favorite Ephesians 3, start in verse 1. This is, uh, Ephesians 3 is packed so full of goodies. Amen. Here's your seven pound burrito. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. 
if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Listen to this. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, whom am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Why were they unsearchable? They were hid. Paul knew the Mosaic law. You don't think he knew exactly what he was saying here? He knew the Pharisees were going to go search for this prophecy. It was hid. Verse 9, which we have on the wall here. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be, made, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Steve likes to talk about folding paper, the many folds. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Jesus Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Again, Peter was with Jesus for about three years. Never heard one thing about this. If you're unsure about why we are so adamant about the gospel given unto Paul, read Romans 2.16 one more time. We better be studying God's word rightly divided according to 2 Timothy 2.15. And just so you know, he did finish that burrito in 25 minutes. Wow. Oh. And the next thing he talked about was going to an ice cream place tomorrow to finish that challenge. Yeah, so it's, I talk, we, we were talking with the, uh, we were talking with the owner, she said about 80% fail that challenge. And I started thinking about that when you bring the, the gospel of the grace of God given to Paul, how many, what a percentage fail to see the mystery that was revealed and the fact that sometimes to them it's disgusting and intriguing at the same time. Sometimes they just don't want it. Sometimes you shut down. They shut down. The truth is we need to be redeeming the time, just like Ephesians 6. Ephesians, sorry. I think I have it wrong. Nope, it is Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is our prayer for everyone in this room and those who couldn't be here today. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That is all I have today. That's my admonition to all of us today, including myself, that we can speak boldly with confidence 
because of Romans 2.16. God's going to judge each and every one of us based on the gospel that was given to Paul. Not the gospel that was given to Moses. Moses.